Hi again from National Training Event 2018. We have another special guest today, Kamal Wiraku, uh, who's involved in AFES networks, but also with Christ College and the Presbyterian Church of New South Wales. So, hello, Kamal. Oh, hi, yes, Amy. I'm good, very good. And Kamal, you've been in AFES networks for a number of years now. Which campus are you located at, and what is your role there? So at the moment, I'm working on the campus of Macquarie University in North Ryde, and I, uh, I've had a whole lot of different roles there. Sometimes I do the talks, the, the, the Bible talks, the main talks, but at, my main role has been running the small group leadership training. So it's great fun for me. I train people in how to run small groups on campus. I uh, train the students in how to answer tough questions if they have non-Christians in the group and so on, how to make groups friendly for non-Christian visitors, what to do if a student is going through some sort of crisis and they need immediate pastoral help. It's great fun. And my aim is that through training these young people in small group leadership skills, that we're launching a whole new generation to churches, including Presbyterian churches, to be useful and train and lead other people into the knowledge of God through the scriptures. It's a fantastic opportunity. Now, for people who have been in Kamal Strand groups before, either at National Training Event or even Next Gen, which is a conference for uh, youth in Katoomba, uh, you tend to release photos with people posing like this. Oh yeah! Now, I'm, what does that stand for? And why, why are you so committed to this? Right, yes. now, in the USA, that's a gang sign. So if you're American, don't do it, you'll get shot. Now, <laughs> The way that I've adopted it is that stands for Westminster, which is the Westminster Standards of the Presbyterian Church. And so now I hold very much, and the Westminster Standards hold very much, to the Bible as the inspired Word of God. So the Westminster Standards are not inspired. But what they are is a 400-year-old summary of what the Bible says. And personally, as I read the Westminster Standards, they tell me, in a sense, better than what I can summarize myself, what the Bible says. So I'm committed to the Westminster Standards as a summary of my faith, which is actually one of my ordination vows. So I actually believe that. Now, I think the Westminster Standards are a fantastic way to meditate on and reflect on a summary of what the whole Bible says. Doesn't mean that we believe it over and above the Bible, but it teaches us what the great leaders of the past, what great theologians of the past, believe the Bible said. And I'm happy to stand in that tradition and I want to advance that tradition and that understanding of the Bible. So in a sense, I'm being honest that I believe what the Westminster Standards believe. And if you ask me, what does the Bible say? Then I will say things that are in line with the Westminster Standards. So for me, it's a statement of honesty. And this is what I think the Bible says. It's also a, a way of standing in the tradition of the church. So yesterday evening here at AFES National Training Event, Kevin DeYoung led us in reciting the Nicene Creed. So I believe in the, the, the tradition of a summary of what we believe and a summary of what the church has believed throughout the past. It's a way of being properly what we say is Catholic. Now, not Roman Catholic. I believe the Pope is the Antichrist. Or to be more precise, I believe the, the office of papacy is anti-Christian. And you can quote me on that because that's part of what the Westminster Confession says. But to be truly Catholic, to stand in the great tradition of the people who have believed what the Bible says, to believe what the apostles say the real Jesus believes. That's a good thing. And so standing in those, the tradition of those creeds, like the Nicene Creed and the other great Protestant confessions of the past that happened in the Protestant Reformation, including great creeds like the 39 Articles of the Anglican Church, and praise God for the 39 Articles, and the Savoy Declaration of the Congregationalist Churches, and praise God for the... Savoy Declaration, the Heidelberg Catechism of the Continental Reformed Churches. It's a great uh, declaration, a great statement of faith, which I have used even in my statements, uh, even in my sermons. So mm. that's why I make the joke of Westminster, uh, of, of, of the Westminster, that I stand in this Westminster tradition. I teach in accordance with that Westminster tradition, and I recommend everybody else do the same. So on... The Saturday night and Sunday night talks, Kevin really didn't shy away from bringing a lot of big uh, uh, phrases and terms for uh, understanding systematic theology. Um, next year in semester two, you're actually taking the Doctrine of God and Work of Christ Senior Theology Unit. What excites you about that unit in particular? Okay, so on our very first night, 
Kevin DeYoung said that Francis Turretin, who is a great reformed theologian of the past, he said, so Kevin said that Turretin said, the two most difficult topics in the Christian faith are the doctrine of the Trinity and what it means for Jesus to be God and man. So I'm going to be teaching both of those <laughs> topics. So why not just bite off more than we can chew and chew real hard. But just like Kevin DeYoung has over the last few weeks been opening the scriptures to us, showing why the doctrine of the Trinity is deeply scriptural, but also leads to piety and doxology. As we know, the one true God who is Trinity, we worship him better. We love him more. We are more deeply convinced that he is for us and that he loves us and that he can hold us in the palm of his hand both now and forever. And as we come to know Jesus, who became human, and the same Jesus who died and rose for us and is now at the Father's right hand praying for us, we have deep confidence that God loves us and that God is a kind God who does not stand far away and lecture at us like some school mom, but a God who comes close by and gets down in the dirt and dust of our mistakes and of this hurting world and has compassion and sympathy with us. And that same God actually paid the penalty so that we can stand before him in eternal bodies, with eternal bodies, uh, rejoicing forever. All of this is bound up in what it means for God to be Trinity and for Jesus to be simultaneously God and man. So I sincerely hope that just like Kevin DeYoung has over the last few nights given us a magnificent exposition of our God, that as our students next year, as my students next year, as we learn more of what it means to know this God and worship this God, trust and believe and live for this God, that my people are deeply encouraged in their faith. I want my people to worship God more consistently and with more overflowing love and joy and with more knowledge to therefore lead their people, the people of their churches, youth groups, Sunday schools, to know and love and worship this God more rigorously and vigorously. I think Turretin had a point. These two are the most difficult topics of the Christian faith, but precisely because they are the most difficult topics of the Christian faith, they are also the richest, and they lead to the, 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 the most doxology and piety, praise and worship of God and life for Him. Mm. So for someone who's uh, a serious uh, study of the Bible, and I hope all of us at NTER, I'm um, trying to understand more of the explanations of these doctrines. How, do, how does someone move from someone who's regularly reading the Bible to um, tackling topics in systematic theology? What are some tips or a bit of advice you might give to someone who wants to, I guess, take the next step in studying theology for them? Yep. Well, first thing is keep reading the Bible because the Bible is inspired, systematic theology is not. The second thing is get hold of some resources and see how systematic theologians, the people who do systematic theology, how we seek to articulate what the Bible says and critically analyze. Are these systematic theologians saying what the Bible says? So John McLean, one of our lecturers at Christ College, has written a resource called, um, I've forgotten the title. Well, it's right here. The Real, real God. God for the Real World, which is also at the bookstore at NTE. Yes, more so about there you go. Stuff. So John McLean has tried to, and I think he does an excellent job of summarizing systematic theology in really simple language. So read resources like Real God for the Real World by John McLean. Read some great systematic theology lecturers like um, Michael Horton. So he's written uh, a, a big volume called The Christian Faith, which is, I think, the best current systematic theology. Read some systematic theology from the past. John Calvin, one of our great people from the past, a great reformed theologian of the past. His famous institutes, or Francis Turretin, whom I've already mentioned. He, his, um, he, his systematic theology has been translated into English. And so you can purchase that. You can get it online and read it. See if you can wrestle with the great Francis Turretin or other people like that. Herman Barvik, who lived about 100 years ago and wrote, great systematic theology for the 20th century, reformed systematic theology. See how these people seek to articulate con the uh, topics like, what does it mean to be human? Theological anthropology is the technical term. Drop that at a, a party sometime. See if you can um, impress people. Uh, topics like, what does it mean to be saved? Soteriology and other great themes from the Bible. What are they talking about? How does this 
interact with the Bible? Are you convinced that what the Bible says is what the theologians are saying? If you are convinced, how does that nourish your piety? How does it help you? So a theological anthropology, a deeply biblical understanding of what it means to be human. How does that help us live well? How does that help us to worship God and love our neighbor as ourselves? That's the best way that you can become a really good systematic theologian. A good systematic theologian is deeply biblical, is properly systematic in the sense that we know what the deep themes of the Bible is. And precisely because we are biblical and systematic, we live well, we worship God properly, or as we worship God well, and we seek to live and care for people in this world. Well, thank you, Kamal. Christ College is deeply committed to reform theology, and you can find out more information about that on our website. But if you have questions about systematic theology or what studying theology at Christ College looks like, you can go to our NTE website at www.christcollege.edu.au forward slash NTE, and we can send you more information about that. I'll put you in touch with Kamal or John McLean, our Vice Principal and Systematic Theology Lecturer. Thanks for your time, Kamal. Thank you, Sammy. And Westminster. <laughs> Yes. <laughs>